I still found myself worrying for my mom and hoping that she was being taken care of. I couldn't force myself to detach completely like a good Scientologist would. While I should have been able to block it all out, somehow the past always managed to force its way in, and it might have stayed that way had it not been for a bright spot that helped me get through this and refocus my energy on the Sea Org. More than ever before, I found myself relying on the weekly graduation ceremonies at Flag to inspire me and keep my spirits high. Whereas, when I was younger, I was simply caught up in the spectacle of these events, I now found myself paying more attention to the words that were spoken and the stories of what Scientology could accomplish. I was particularly drawn in by the wins that graduates would speak of every week. Wins were the big reveals, the prizes at the end that kept people coming back for more. And I was no different. These testimonials always demonstrated the power of Scientology, providing everyone with a clear sense of the potential that it could unlock. It was almost like I needed something to throw myself into at this vulnerable time, to get my mind off of things and focus on something positive. The winds came in all shapes and sizes. People would talk about how, at first, they were unsure if they could afford the fees for the courses, but by the time they were done with the classes, they had turned their companies around and become so successful that they were now earning ten times their previous income. Other people would say that they were so exterior, meaning outside of their bodies, that when they got up after an auditing session, they'd realize their body was still in the chair. At one point, I witnessed actress Juliette Lewis sharing her wins after achieving the state of clear, and although I don't remember what she shared, the fact that celebrities like her endorsed Scientology impressed everyone, myself included. No matter who it was sharing, though, the wins always got everyone motivated. The more wins you shared, the more you were telling other people that it worked for you, and the more invested you became, making it harder to turn back on that investment. It was hard to listen to these stirring, emotional stories of transformation and not feel that Scientology had the power to change lives and change the world. Riding this wave of excitement, I started to take the auditing courses for which I'd come to flag. With me in CMO and in the course room was a girl my age, Louisa. We became fast friends. Her family was from Denmark, and while her dad had also been posted at INT, she had been raised in L.A., first at the PAC ranch at the L.A. Cadet Org. Louisa was painfully shy, but with a good sense of humor, and I could tell right away that she was trustworthy. Louisa and I tried to be serious in the course room, but sometimes we'd let loose. We would often find ways to escape to the bathroom, where we'd have a toilet paper war between our two stalls. Other times we'd chase each other up and down the stairs. We lived in the same dorm, so before bed or during meals, She'd tell me stories about growing up on the pack ranch, which made it seem that those cadets did less work than we did. Still, listening to her stories, I learned that they too were treated badly, perhaps even worse than we had been at the ranch. The new course I was on was professional TRs. The training routines I was going to be tackling now were the pro TRs. And though there were some similarities with the TRs I'd done at the ranch years earlier, these were much more rigorous. I needed to do them to become an auditor. After several days of reading the policies and theory behind the TRs and watching films and listening to LRH lectures on tape, I moved on to the practical section of the course, the TRs themselves. From the start, they were grueling. I focused on just getting through them as best I could. The way out was the way through. I had to be able to sit comfortably in a chair in front of another student for two hours straight without speaking, moving, twitching, coughing, or blinking excessively. Many people, including me, stayed on this training routine for weeks. At one point, I had been motionless for 90 minutes when a fly landed on my nose. I blew it away with my lips, which caused me to flunk, and I had to start over again. It was excruciating, several times bringing me to tears. I found it almost impossible not to move. My legs felt like they were going to walk away on their own, and it took everything I had to stay still. The TR bull bait was much worse than the kids' version. We had to endure two hours of being yelled at, made fun of, and even sexually taunted. One of the supervisors specialized in creeping people out, saying suggestive things to which we weren't allowed to react. A good friend of mine, who was also 13, 
was being bull baited by a male student who went on and on for hours about her blooming breasts being like tiny rosebuds. She had succeeded in not reacting, but the whole thing had disgusted me. When we were done with the pro TR course, we moved to the upper indoctrination TRs. Here we learned about tone 40, which was a state of mind at which point you were absolutely 100% positive in your thought, with no room for opposition or anticipation. LRH believed that all humans could be put on a scale according to their emotional state. The tone scale began at negative 40, defined as total failure, at the bottom of the scale, and ended at positive 40, the serenity of beingness. The tone scale applied to your tone of voice, delivery, and emotional state. A tone 40 delivery was so powerful and precise that the person getting the command would follow the order no matter what. My twin and I took turns practicing our tone 40 deliveries in the routines that were laid out in LRH policies. We'd sit at a wall and say a command to our twin, who then had to follow that command. Each command was always followed by a thank you. Look at that wall, thank you. Walk over to that wall, thank you. Touch that wall, thank you. Turn around, thank you. It continued like this for hours. The next exercise was geared toward helping us control the people we were auditing. As auditors, we would have to use any means necessary to prevent the pre-clears from leaving a session before it was over. Our job was to keep them in place until we had given them permission to leave. This exercise taught us to do that both physically and verbally. I'd always heard that this was the most fun. You used the same patter. Walk over to that wall, thank you. This time, however, your twin would do everything physically possible to disobey, running away, pulling away, shouting, refusing to move, anything. You had to physically force them to follow your command in order to succeed. I twinned with my burly friend Buster on some of these exercises. Because he was so large, it was more of a challenge. As it was with all others who did this routine, if I wanted him to look at the wall... I had to pry open his eyes and twist his head. Getting your coach over to the wall was the hardest part, since you had to drag, push, or even carry him. To top it off, you would be bull-baited the entire time, so you couldn't laugh or get upset. You passed when you could get your twin to comply with the commands, regardless of any physical and verbal obstacles. Next, we had to yell at square glass ashtrays at the top of our lungs. The idea was to train ourselves to express absolutely clear intentions, and by mastering this, we'd be able to guide our future pre-clears to successfully confront things. And it didn't end there. Directing our intentions into particular parts of the ashtray, we'd ask our ashtray very specific questions. The belief was that whenever you asked a question, you had the intention of getting that question answered, as you should when you asked a question of a pre-clear in session the ashtray was required to be square. We were to direct questions into each of its four corners. Are you an ashtray? Are you a corner? Are you made of glass? The same principles that we were trying to learn and understand as auditors were the principles that prevented us from questioning these ridiculous tasks. We'd been trained to follow instructions, just as we were now learning how to make others follow ours. Outlandish as all these tasks were, none of them ever struck me as odd, but remembering the scene now, they were. We'd stand there for hours next to our twin, packed into a room full of other twins, each pair doing a different part of the course. Some would be barking orders to go to the wall, while others sat silently as they stared deeply into each other's eyes. In another part of the room, someone would be yelling insults as part of a bull bait session, at the same time that someone a few feet away was screaming instructions to an ashtray. All these courses were supposed to be about training auditors to be smooth with their communication and less distracting to pre-clears in session. But the result was that it made all of us more robotic. It automated our responses, turning everything we said into a script. Furthermore, the exercises themselves encouraged us to see the people we were auditing not as people with feelings, but as reactive minds that needed to be bent to the will of the auditing session for their own good. The dialogue was designed to dehumanize, 
The fact that we spent time practicing on an ashtray only emphasized that. The Tone 40 commands in particular were about getting people to follow orders without questioning. With courses like these, it was often hard to tell what real progress looked like. Sometimes I'd work hard to follow the instructions but only have frustration to show for it. Other times I was rewarded with success. There wasn't much consistency, and it could be difficult to get a definitive sense of what improvement was. Even if you were a natural at something, it seemed like they would keep you in place just to make you put in the time. Much of it seemed subject to the whims of the course supervisor, but no one thought much of it as long as we moved up in the TR levels. The training was hard work, but being an auditor was a glorified position, and I wanted to prove that I could do it. In the back of my mind were Aunt Shelley's words about the importance of being a good auditor. She'd always told me the best messengers were auditors, and while I was at Flag, she continued to encourage my training. I saw her every few months when she came to town. She would speak to me for at least an hour, always pushing me, saying I could do it, reminding me that auditors were the only ones who could save people. When I wasn't taking my auditor classes, I worked a few hours a day in the CMO department responsible for making sure people were ethical. People who worked in this department wielded a lot of power. They had the authority to be the enforcers, and they used their power to make sure people towed the line. Because I was training to do this job at CMO Int, this job was good practice, although I didn't have to dole out punishments. As it turned out, I knew my co-workers, Olivia and Julia, through Valeska. Because of her, I had been friendly with them even though they were at least three years older than I, and was glad they were in CMO and in my department, because now I could fraternize with them without getting in trouble. They were both really nice and very pretty. Apparently my uncle had been impressed with their abilities and had promoted them both. One of my duties was to give the mail that had been sent from relatives of people in the CMO to Olivia and Julia, who served as the screeners. In CMO, they had passed around a slip that we were required to sign, allowing our mail to be opened and inspected. Every piece of mail had to be read before it was distributed. If there was any sign of anti-Scientology sentiment, the letter was not passed on. Just as I was settling into a routine with my auditor training at FLAG, the fact that I had not completed all the prerequisites to be a Sea Org trainee began to nag at me. Though I'd raised the issue with Tom when I'd first arrived at FLAG that I hadn't done the Sea Org's boot camp, known as EPF, he had told me not to worry. I tried to put it out of my mind, but I felt like I was just a cadet dressed up as a Sea Org member, and I wanted to be a real member. Concerned, I wrote a letter to Aunt Shelley. In the letter, I told her I hadn't done the EPF and thought I should have. A week or so later, I was called to the office of Mr. Sue Gentry, the head RTC rep at FLAG. When I arrived, she handed me a letter Aunt Shelley had written me. In it, she scolded me about not wanting to do the boot camp, saying that everyone had to do EPF, even senior executives, and I was no exception. Clearly, she had misread my letter to her and thought that I was trying to get out of my obligation rather than trying to fulfill it. Apparently, Aunt Shelley had instructed Mr. Gentry to make sure my complaining was addressed. So Mr. Gentry said I was going to do a little cleanup. I was nervous when another RTC rep, Mr. Wilson, came in and told me we were going to have a session immediately. He began with the two standard questions. Was I tired and was I hungry? I was prepared for what always came next, the booming Tone 40 command. This is the session. Instead, I heard him say, I am not auditing you. My stomach dropped. This indicated that I was not receiving auditing, but rather a security check, in other words, a confessional. Unlike auditing sessions, your confessions were not confidential and could be used against you for disciplinary actions. My confessional stretched out over several weeks. I was asked everything from had I stolen anything, to had I done anything unethical on the second dynamic, to had I done anything I didn't want my parents to find out about. The interrogation procedure still relied on the needle readings of the e-meter. If my e-meter didn't show a floating needle, my auditor asked variations of the question until the needle gave either a negative or an affirmative. The e-meter's answer always trumped your own. If the meter said yes, 
The answer was yes, even if yours had been no. If your needle was dirty, it meant you hadn't revealed everything. On every transgression you gave up, you had to tell when and where, an extremely detailed what, how you justified it, and who almost found out. As with auditing sessions, each security check session ended with a trip to the examiner. If your needle didn't float, you would be required to go right back into session to find out what was missed. What made all this particularly arduous was not just the invasive nature of the questions, but how relentless the people asking them always were. They wouldn't ask you a question once and be done with it. They'd ask the same questions over and over, your fear mounting each time that the meter would contradict your words. They were like detectives investigating a murder, and once the meter gave them the reading they were looking for, you were guilty. While this questioning itself was stressful, the real impact was something much more deeply psychological and unsettling. The repeated nature of the questions made you doubt yourself in ways that were hard to describe, especially when the e-meter indicated that you did have an answer to the question. At first, you would know the answer, but as they asked the same question over and over again with increasing levels of intensity, suddenly you'd start to doubt yourself. These were confessions for things that you knew for a fact had never happened, and yet after hearing the same question for long enough, you'd start to think that maybe your answer was wrong. Maybe you had done this in some alternate universe and somehow didn't know about it. Maybe you were withholding something. Every question was a conflict of interest. If you admitted to doing something wrong, you would be punished. But if you told the truth and the meter questioned your answer, you'd get asked the question over and over again until you gave the answer that they were looking for. So many times I'd end a session not having done any of the things I'd admitted to, just because it was the only way to make it end. Mostly, though, I just prayed for my needle to float. When Mr. Wilson was finally finished, he wrote up a knowledge report of anything that had come up in my sessions. He turned this over to ethics, and I had to address each transgression and prove that I was now taking responsibility for it by correcting it or making the necessary amends. Once that was completed, Mr. Gentry informed me that I would be starting the Sea Org EPF the next day. Everybody did the EPF at his or her own pace. Some people took two or three weeks. Others could be on the program for months. It all depended on how long it took people to get through their life history, various security checks, and required courses. The required courses all had to do with the history, structure, and attitude of a Sea Org member. They included such courses as Welcome to the Sea Org, Introduction to Scientology Ethics, Personal Grooming, and Basic Sea Org Member Hat. We also listened to various LRH tapes and learned our code and purpose. The basic purpose of the Sea Org is to get in ethics on this planet and universe. For EPF, I was moved into a different dorm in the Hacienda with 12 other girls who were also just joining the Sea Org. Every morning we woke up early, donned blue shorts, blue t-shirts, and boots, and did military close-order drills. None of these bothered me because I was already accustomed to them from the ranch. Next, we took the bus into the flag base, where we were assigned to clean the various restaurants and hotel rooms in Fort Harrison and the Hubbard Guidance Center, where the public Scientologists received their auditing. We had 15 minutes for breakfast, then we had to bus and clean the entire dining room after hundreds of staff and public had eaten there before us. After this was completed, we had study time, followed by cleaning everything from stairwells to galley floors to any public spaces that needed attention. There were about 20 people on the EPF with me, and nobody was over the age of 18. One small boy was only nine. He had come with his mother to flag to take services. He wound up being recruited into the Sea Org, much like everybody else on the EPF. There was always a huge recruitment drive, and there was always at least one person recruited each week. Our taskmaster, Dave Engelhart, played the role of drill sergeant. He was a longtime Sea Org member who had worked with LRH. He had a reputation for being tough and ruthless with a touch of crazy, and he lived up to every word. He would take us out on a sailboat to give us the whole Sea Org experience, but while he was supposed to be teaching us to sail, instead he'd just shout out random commands at the top of his lungs, then get angry that we didn't know how to sail a boat. 
At uniform inspections, he would sniff the air and say, Someone here stinks. We would all look dumbfounded, but he'd scream out in a rage, What is that smell? One time, he dove down to the ground and pulled a Russian guy's foot, causing him to fall over. It's you, you fucking pig, he fumed. Go wash your goddamn feet and don't you ever, ever come to one of my musters smelling like shit again. Even though I was only 13, I had to fill out a life history, a form that asked a lot of personal questions, many of them very adult-oriented. I was asked to provide my name, birthplace, social security number, other ID numbers, credit cards, and bank accounts, as well as their numbers and expiration dates. I also had to fill in the names of all my relatives and how they felt about Scientology, and if I had ever been connected to someone who was critical of the church. There was a space for me to list what Scientology courses I had done, as well as any auditing I had received. Whether I had ever committed a crime or been in jail, or if I had been part of the government or any type of intelligence organization. I was also supposed to detail every single sexual experience, including masturbating, that I had ever had. If I had ever engaged in anything homosexual in nature, any and all medications I had ever taken, any hospitalizations, illegal or abused drugs, and the dates. I knew I had to do it, but it was hard to understand why the church needed this information. The theory of confessionals made sense to me, but this was not standard confessional procedure, and what did my relatives' names have to do with my eligibility? I was too young to have a credit card, but why would they need that info? Even though I had nothing to hide, I felt like the church was asking me for information just for the sake of having it, almost asking for material they might blackmail me with that served no Scientologic purpose. I felt like I was handing over a piece of myself. I did it anyway, of course, rationalizing that if I had nothing to hide, I shouldn't have a problem with it. Once I'd completed EPF for the Sea Org, I had to do the EPF that was just for CMO. The uniform I was given was a pair of dark blue pants paired with a white polo shirt. My day started off with an early morning bus to the WB to clean the executive offices. We had to follow the basic sequence for cleaning a room, as laid out by LRH, a very thorough cleaning indeed. Our morning studies included a lot of basic courses, including keys to competence, basic cleaning, basic computer, and basic messenger hat. This EPF had a lot of cleaning. We would clean the berthings of the CMO executives and RTC reps and had to do it perfectly. We also made their beds, turned down their sheets, and left snacks, usually fruit, cheese, and crackers. We would even clean their cars if they asked us to. When all that was done, we did their laundry, following a very precise procedure— we had to iron their clothes using starch and could not leave train tracks along the seams. We had to steam their pants and polish their shoes and put them away so that they were ready to wear. Any items that went in drawers were folded impeccably before we stacked them. To complete our CMO EPF, we had to pass our cleaning as well as laundry skills. The execs received vote sheets and graded each of us for our services in housekeeping and laundry. The laundry room had about 20 washers and dryers for the thousand-plus crew at Flag. Two washers and dryers were dedicated to executives and were not to be used by anyone else, even if those machines were idle. The crew could only do their laundry on Friday night and Saturday morning, which meant there were always huge lines, many people staying up past four in the morning to use a machine at all. The execs could get shirts whenever they needed them, but general crew members only had one or two shirts— which meant they had to hand wash and iron theirs daily. My friend Louisa and I were often on assignment with our little friend Charlie, the nine-year-old boy who was now on the CMO EPF with us. Charlie was an impish troublemaker who needed constant monitoring. He had an uncanny ability to intend to clean a birthing and then turn what was already relatively clean into a disaster. One time we all got in trouble because instead of doing the dishes like he was supposed to, he had shoved them all into the oven where they sat for several days before an executive found them. Even though our nine-year-old wild card was the one who had hidden the dishes, we all got yelled at. Though he was a nuisance, it's only in retrospect that I can see Charlie for what he was, a neglected young boy. He was often lost in whatever he was doing. His hair was always unbrushed. 
He never washed his clothes and probably didn't even know how, so he had giant stains all over his uniform. Once, when he was ordered to go clean his shirt by an executive, we found him five minutes later in the bathroom, trying to clean his shirt in the toilet. Lost as he may have been, it was easy to get annoyed with him for his unusual behavior. After all, Luisa and I were punished because of it. However, for me, he was as much a curiosity as a source of annoyance. I didn't realize it then, but he was the first child I'd encountered who actually acted like a child. At the ranch, we didn't have kids like him. Kids at the ranch were too busy being little adults. In Charlie, I was witnessing how a kid was supposed to behave at this age. He seemed totally foreign, as though his brain was wired in a way that I'd never encountered, with an absence of logic and unique ignorance of instructions. Never before had I met a child this impulsive, and only now can I see that I, not he, was the strange one for expecting him to follow orders. Chapter 17 Handling Family Within a couple of months, I had finished both my EPFs and was back to studying five hours and working the rest of the day with Olivia and Julia. But just as I was starting to get comfortable back in the CMO, problems with my family threatened to complicate things once more. It started with my brother, one day at lunch, my friend Jessica, who had briefly been with me in my early days at the ranch, told me she had just seen my brother at the hacienda. I told her that was impossible because Justin was in California at the int base, so she must have mistaken someone else for him. She said she was sure it was him and that he was on RPF, like my mother. It seemed he had broken the rules and received the worst punishment in the church. The RPF lived ate, and worked separately from other staff, but we still saw them every now and then when they were doing projects around the base, and of course they were always running everywhere they went. They lived at the hacienda in separate quarters. I couldn't believe that Justin was on the RPF. I hadn't seen him since I left California for flag in June 1996 and had no idea that he had even been in trouble. Why hadn't anyone told me? Later that afternoon, Mr. Wilson came into my office and closed the door, as he had been told I was asking questions about Justin. So, you heard about your brother? he asked. Well, yes, he is on the RPF and there is not much more I can say. My eyes started tearing up. The fact that I now had two family members on RPF was almost too much to take. In the church's eyes, we were probably becoming a family of criminals, but all I could think was that my family was coming apart at the seams. Why are you crying? Mr. Wilson asked. I tried to find a reason that was not purely emotional, but I couldn't figure out a logical, excusable justification for my emotional display. This is the Sea Org, and that is just the way things are, Mr. Wilson continued unsympathetically. I haven't seen my own sister in years. She was an RTC trainee, now I have no idea where she is. It is nothing to cry about. I haven't even seen my wife in a year and have no idea what is going on with her. Yes, sir, I said, trying to contain my emotions. The next day, I received a letter from Aunt Shelley, explaining that Justin was being sent to Flag to do the RPF and apologizing in advance if I found out before her letter reached me. She seemed sorry to have to be the one to tell me that Justin had supposedly gone out to D with my friend Eva. He had also blown which meant he had taken off from the int base without permission. Aunt Shelley asked that I not be hard on him, as he had already been through enough. Once I knew Justin was at flag on his RPF, I started to see him in passing. On occasion, I was able to give him a hug and talk to him briefly. He would sometimes send me a list of anything he needed, like shampoo, and I would do my best to get it for him. He was only being paid $15 per week, which made it hard for him to afford the Avita shampoo he liked, so I'd use some of my $25 weekly pay to cover the difference. Money was tight for me, too, though. There were no meals after 5 in the afternoon, and by 10.30 when I got home I would be starving, so I always bought myself Frosted Flakes at the canteen, an expense that added up. I heard through the grapevine that my brother was doing his purification rundown while on the RPF. The idea of the purification rundown, or purif, was that a person could get rid of residual toxins and poisons from chemicals or drugs in his body by intense sauna treatments. 
The basic routine was to ingest a bunch of minerals and vitamins, run for 30 minutes, then sit in a sauna set at 160 degrees for five hours a day with occasional breaks. The point was the first step on LRH's bridge to total freedom. People had supposedly seen Justin in the Purif area in the early morning, and my plan to see him more was to do the Purif too, even though I had already done it at the Int base when I was nine. When I'd done it back then, we had to take several thousand milligrams of niacin, an extremely high dose, which was supposed to help dislodge the toxins. Next were the handfuls of vitamins and minerals to replace those lost in sweating. At nine years old, I naturally didn't like swallowing pills, so I'd fake it and hide them in my bag. Then we had to drink a quarter cup of vegetable oil, as this helped to put in the good fat, which then pushed out the bad fat where the toxins usually resided. This was absolutely vile, and I would gag trying to get it down. Finally, we drank cow mag, but I was used to that. Before we got in the sauna, we had to run for 30 minutes to get the niacin circulating in our bloodstream. The 30 minutes was way too hard for me, so I'd end up walking most of the time. I'd still get a niacin flush, which was an uncomfortable red prickly rash. Then I would sit in the sauna for hours. I was in there with older men who would be dripping with sweat, but because I was young, I would hardly sweat at all. Whenever I was out of the sauna to cool off for more than a few minutes, a staff person in charge of the Purif would usher me back in, telling me I was taking too many breaks. The purification rundown went on like this for a few weeks, and by the end I was ready for it to be over. My young body wasn't prepared for temperatures like that. The Purif could be a pain, with all of the vitamins and high temperatures, but you were required to take at least five hours in the sauna, where you could chat with the others, read your favorite book, and even play board games which was much more fun and exciting than being on course. More important, though, it now offered a way for me to see my brother. I used whatever I could to get on the Purif. I confessed that when I'd done the Purif at the ranch, I hadn't taken the majority of my vitamins. In addition, I mentioned that I wasn't sure I had achieved the end phenomena and brought up how I'd had a bloody nose after it, which wasn't a good sign that the Purif had been successful. After hearing this, my case supervisor agreed that I could do this next step and I started almost immediately. Unfortunately, it was all for naught. Though I had requested it solely in order to see Justin, after a couple of days I found out that RPFers did their Purif at night. My plan had backfired, and as usual, the sauna was too hot for me. I took a lot of breaks or lay on the floor where it was cooler. The 30-minute run prior to the sauna was the worst part. Thankfully, Lisa Marie Presley happened to be on the Purif at the same time, so my exercise time would often get cut down. When she was in the gym, nobody else was allowed in. She would run on the treadmill while listening to Madonna. While I'd never seen Lisa Marie before, like most Scientologists, I knew that she was part of the church. She appeared in many Scientology promotional pieces, and some of her Scientology projects were announced at the church events. The Celebrity Center even published a magazine that often featured success stories and testimonials from celebrities about their belief. Every celebrity had a code name used on their pre-clear folders to protect their privacy. Lisa Marie was referred to as Norma, or Norma Darling. I assumed the celebrities had made up names so that people wouldn't snoop, or in case their folders ended up in the wrong hands. On the Purif, Lisa Marie was in one sauna, while five or six of us were in the other. I would sometimes see her in the changing room, or pass her in the hallways. She was shy, but friendly. She had seen my name written on something and asked me if I was related to David Miscavige, so I told her I was his niece. From then on, she said hi whenever she walked by. One afternoon, when I was finished with the sauna, I was approached by Anne Rathbun, who is now the head RTC rep. She told me that my brother wanted to leave the Sea Org, and she wanted me to help talk him out of it. I agreed to meet with Justin in the security offices, which were in the garage of the Fort Harrison Hotel. Those small rooms were fitted with cameras, where we could be observed while we spoke. From the start, I felt strange. I tried to convince Justin to stay, but speaking to him and knowing that we were being recorded was awkward. I hadn't spoken to him in nearly two years, and I just wanted to talk to him off the record. But when we were in those rooms, and even when we were outside them, Justin simply refused to talk to me about the Sea Org. He knew as well as I did that we were being filmed. I could tell he was really troubled, because he was the type of person who always put on a comedic face. And now he didn't. 
I was also confused as to why he was suddenly going by the name Justin Tompkins, rather than Justin Miscavige. Ever since my dad had married my mother when Justin was two, he had gone by Justin Miscavige. I asked Mr. Rathbun if she knew, and she said it was for PR reasons. The church didn't want people to know that a Miscavige was leaving or on the RPF. Mr. Rathbun told me that I was not to speak about Justin's situation with anyone. Things only got worse when I learned from the RTC rep, Mr. Rodriguez, who was auditing my brother, that he had been classified as a List One rock slammer. This meant that while Justin was in session and talking about Scientology, his needle did a rock slam, a wild slashing back and forth in a crazy motion. A rock slam signified that someone had an underlying evil intention against whatever he was talking about at the time, and in his case, it was Scientology itself. LRH said that List One rock slammers had done no good in their entire past, lifetime after lifetime, and had only brought harm to people. She then showed me the LRH policy on List One rock slammers. One of my friends had been assigned to the RPF on the grounds of a List One rock slam alone. When I told Mr. Rodriguez that I didn't believe he was a rock slammer, she told me it had been verified by the video of the session. The next time I saw my brother, he seemed genuinely hurt by being named a List One rock slammer. I tried to console him by telling him I didn't believe it. However, it was clear that I wasn't getting anywhere trying to convince him to stay. Mr. Rathbun eventually said she didn't want me to talk to Justin anymore, as it wasn't panning out and violated a policy called Leaving and Leaves, which forbade staff to talk to each other about leaving the Sea Org or Scientology. While I was disappointed that I couldn't help Justin more, and help the church more, there was also a small part of me that was starting to see that maybe all this was happening for a reason. I never would have admitted it to anyone, but little by little I began to see that maybe the only way for Justin to be truly happy was for him to leave, as he had apparently wanted to do for a long time. Until then, I hadn't really thought about his leaving in terms of what would be best for him. I'd only thought about what was best for the church. But as I listened to his reasons and arguments, it seemed to make sense why he would be considering departure. One afternoon, several weeks later, I was called out from the sauna and told to go to the WB right away. I protested at first, concerned because you weren't allowed to cut your five hours short. However, I was told that I absolutely had to, because someone very important needed to see me. I put on my uniform and took off for the WB in one of the vans. I wasn't sure if I should be worried or excited. At the WB, I was directed to the upstairs auditing room at the end of the hall. I was surprised when the Inspector General RTC, Marty Rathbun himself, walked in. He was the second in command of the Church of Scientology. He was one of the few executives who worked with my uncle, whom I had never really known, so I didn't know what to expect. Hi, Jenna, he said, flashing a smile, and introduced himself. Have you heard anything about your mother over the past year? No, sir, I said which was the absolute truth. I had no idea how she was progressing. I had received no calls, letters, or updates from anyone, not even my father. Dad had been writing me several times a week, but he never mentioned her. He had also been very insistent that I call him, even sending me a calling card to use at the payphone, since I couldn't dial out on the org phones. When I asked about her, he always said he didn't know anything and assumed she was simply doing her program. Unfortunately... Mr. Rathbun only had more bad news. Your mom is going to be declared a suppressive person, he said very matter-of-factly. She wants to leave the Sea Org. She has taken off several times without permission. She still is not following orders, and at this point, she started accusing the church of ridiculous things. I've done everything I can, and so at this point, we are probably just going to let her leave. He let that sink in for the briefest of moments before continuing. However, before she leaves, I want you to visit her so that she can't make a legal claim against the church and say she was forbidden from seeing her daughter. There it was. I sat stone-faced, but I felt like my world was unraveling. The thought of her leaving was overwhelming enough on its own, but coming so soon after I'd been forced to think about Justin's possible departure, it felt like too much. It never occurred to me that someone from my own family would be declared an SP, and yet here I was, confronted with that possibility on two fronts. The prospect of my already fractured family suddenly disappearing entirely was unnerving. 
but I managed to maintain my composure. Mr. Rathbun, I'm pretty sure that if I can see her, I can get her to stay. It wasn't a job that I wanted, but I knew it was a duty I had to try to perform. Hearing everything that Mr. Rathbun had to say made me think that perhaps my decision not to speak with her had played a role in her wanting to leave, especially since she'd apparently been asking for pictures of me. I didn't really want to be in the role of arbitrator, and I never wanted to be caught in the middle of all this, but I honestly thought I could make her stay, and if she really was going to leave the church, I wanted to see her before it was too late. Really? he asked, as if he was considering it. Let's see what happens. With that, he told me we were flying to L.A. together that night. We were even flying first class, and Ray Midoff, another senior executive in the church, would be joining us. The fact that I was sitting in first class beside these two senior executives, my feet barely touching the floor, was hard to believe. I slid down in my wide, soft seat and planted my feet firmly on the carpet, thinking about how, a few hours earlier, I'd been following my routine at Flag and now was on a plane flying across the country to see my mom. I truly hoped that I would be able to deliver on my promise and was nervous about what would happen. I felt worried about all the responsibilities I'd assumed on my behalf of my family members and what would be the consequences if I failed. I was only 14, but I had to negotiate with my brother to try to make him stay, respond to my dad's letters, which felt a bit needy and obsessive at times in my mom's absence, and now travel to California to convince my mother to stay in the church. After we landed, the three of us drove to the Int base, where I was to meet Mom. Mr. Rathbun had me wait in a room in Building 36 while he arranged everything. About 30 minutes later, he came in. She is waiting in the next room, he said. I got up slowly, not excited about starting this process. You know, Jenna, I should probably be there when you speak to her. Would you prefer that I be with you guys as part of the conversation? Or would you prefer that I stay at the other end of the room, away from you? I looked at him, considering his offer. In truth, I didn't want him anywhere, because I didn't even want to have a conversation with her, much less have someone watching. I didn't want to confront her about any of these issues, but I felt obligated. Honestly, Mr. Rathbun, I'd prefer to go in there by myself. He seemed surprised by my response, but nodded his head in assent. Okay? If that's what you want, Jenna, I'll allow it. As the door swung open, I caught my first glimpse of her in over a year. She looked thin and somewhat haggard, with tanned skin and sun-streaked hair, like someone who had been working outside. She stood up and started crying as I walked into the room, and that's when I realized just how much I had missed her. All at once I felt awful as though I should have made more of an effort to find out what was happening with her, as though I'd been neglectful of how much she needed to speak to me. I hadn't even thought of what this would mean to her own healing process. We hugged each other for a long time. She wasn't saying anything, so I started the conversation. Look, Mom, I began haltingly, I don't want to make you feel horrible. I tried to avoid using words like out 2D as much as possible, as I really did not want to get into that discussion. I don't think that would be helpful, and that's not why I came here. I just want you to figure out why it happened, resolve it, and move on. I've done so much bad, I feel like I can never make up for it, she stuttered through her tears. This was a bit surprising to hear, as Mr. Rathman had told me a few hours before that she was being uncooperative. Seeing this strong woman, a woman I'd admired and respected my whole life, so upset, I started to fall apart too, but I did my best to compose myself. Mom, you have to remember that no matter what anyone said, did, or implied, you are a good person. LRH would not have put the technology out there to help people if they didn't deserve to be helped. Anyone making you feel guilty or unworthy is guilty and unworthy himself. My mom choked back sobs before I continued. If you can make it through your program, we can be together again. Yes, I'd like that, she replied, nodding her head as though she was already on board. I'd like for us to be in touch. That would help with the tough parts. Mom, of course, I will write, I said, trying to use this opening to get her a bit excited. I'll send you anything you need. Just let me know what it is. She smiled as I spoke. 
the role reversal wasn't lost on either of us. Was it really that horrible or even unnatural that after being separated from my father, her spouse, for years due to her commitment to the church, that she had craved and found solace in a human relationship? This was the perfect recipe for an out to D. Despite her mistake, she had dedicated her life, worked rigorous hours, and given up so much for the cause that I didn't see how an out to D wiped away all the good she had done. It felt like she had sacrificed a lot for the church, and although the punishment was expected and even standard, it just felt so unforgiving. How's Justin? Mom asked, changing the subject. When I told her what had been happening, and that he would most likely be leaving, she didn't seem surprised. Maybe he'll be happier that way, she said, her voice sounding a bit more hopeful. He always wanted to get out. Yes, I think so, I agreed. And with that, we hugged for a long time and said goodbye. In the next room, Mr. Rathbun was waiting for me. He looked at me expectantly and gestured for me to come in. When I gave him the news that Mom wanted to do her program now, he looked shocked. Are you serious? he asked, taken aback. Yes, I said. Stunned as he was, he was clearly very pleased about Mom's decision. He went to speak to her himself, then came back and told me he couldn't believe that I had taken care of this whole problem for him. He was astonished. The next morning, Mr. Rathman came to see me again. He told me that he thought I was such a good ethics officer that he wanted me to talk with my father, who hadn't been doing well on his post since Mom's out 2D. I wasn't sure if he was right about me, but I would if he wanted me to. However, the conversation with Dad was really awkward. When I asked him how he was doing, he said he could be better. I told him things similar to what I had said to Mom, that I believed in him, that he was capable, and that he would be able to pull himself together. He was happy to see me, but not at all interested in my opinion or advice. He was closed off and didn't want to talk about it, which to a degree was understandable. Apparently, my ethics officer skills were not quite as good as Mr. Rathbun had thought they were. Please check your library for the next part of this audiobook.